So it's Mother's Day weekend. And among other things, that reminded me of a book that we read to our kids when they were little. Um, if you've got kids or grandkids, perhaps you might know it. It's called Love Ya Forever. Now, it, it starts with a mom holding her newborn baby boy and rocking him back and forth and back and forth and, and singing him this little song. I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. And you turn the pages of the book and the boy grows up and the mom grows older and you go through all the stages of life and at each stage of life, the same scene repeats. She picks up the, the boy either um, literally in her arms or, or at the end figuratively in, in her mind and rocking him back and forth and back and forth and, and singing that same little song. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. And, and I must confess, pretty much every time I read it, I, I've had to hold back a little bit of a tear especially at the end when the son picks up his old and, and sick mom and, and holds her in his arms and sings the same song to her, just changing the words from baby to, to mama. And then at the very end, when he holds his own new baby daughter in his arms and, and rocks her back and forth and back and forth and sings that same song that his mama sang to him, I'll love you forever, I'll, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Hey, gets me right here, right in the heart, St still does. I mean, love that holds you that close and, and holds you that tight has, well, has, has that sort of effect, it, at least on me. Well, you know what, as, as you read Jesus' story, as you read Jesus' story, I think, Jesus is doing the same sort of thing for you. I mean, you read Jesus' story and you see that Jesus is there. He's holding you close. He's holding you tight. He's wanting you to know that you're safe in his arms and that you're deeply, deeply loved forever and for always. That's certainly what he was telling his disciples. He told his disciples that. He showed them that throughout their time together. <coughs> Even when their lack of understanding... <coughs> drove him crazy uh, at a special meal that he had with his disciples just before his arrest Jesus talked more with them about his love and he washed their feet to make the point that his love was serving and sacrificial and then he showed them the full extent of his love by, by willingly going to a cross and, and, and dying on that cross so that the relationship with God that sin broke could, could be repaired. I, I love you forever. I, I like you for always. And when, speaking of that always, in fact, Jesus, when he was up on a mountain with his, his friends sometime after his resurrection, he even told them that. Here's the quote, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Jesus said, and be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. And then, he's not there. I mean, perhaps you've read the story. Jesus is with them on the mountain, and then he's not. I mean, he's taken up in the clouds, he's gone from their sight, and there seems to be this unmistakable sense that this time Jesus is not going to pop in again anytime soon like he has for the past 40 days. I'm with you for always? It's kind of a funny way of showing it. And yet, that's at least one reason that Jesus did go back to heaven. So he could be with each and every one of us always and forever and let each of us feel his love forever and for always no, no longer limiting himself to time and space like he did when he walked this earth and could only be with a few people at a time but being able as only God can to wrap his loving arms around us wherever and whenever we need him to be and and even if that means doing that for several of us or all of us, all at the same time in different places. And you know what? Looking back, we can see that now. 
But at the time, I don't think Jesus' disciples were expecting things to end up that way. Not so suddenly, not so abruptly, not when there was still so much more to say and to do. I'm thinking Jesus' friends were, were hoping, maybe even expecting, that Jesus would be around for a little while longer. And perhaps that he'd be around long enough to get that new world order started that they were hoping for. And, and that didn't turn out like they expected. When Jesus left that like he did, all that heaven on earth dream of theirs, well, that left with him too. And perhaps, well, perhaps you've had some experience with that too. With, with things not turning out the way that you expected or hoped for or wanted them to. And you know, that can be kind of defeating and deflating and, and discouraging and leave you feeling, well, kind of sad. Which is what I'd expect to see in this story as well. That as Jesus leaves, at least temporarily, that there's this overwhelming sense of confusion and sadness and yet, that's not what Luke reports. Um, check this out. Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. You expect great sadness and, and confusion, and what you read is great joy. Now, how come? And to the point of this conversation, what can we discover from that about living joyfully? And living joyfully even when things don't turn out the way that you want or expect them to. I mean, to get started with that exploration, let me take you back to an earlier part of the conversation right before Jesus took his friends up to the mountain for that very last time. It's in Luke 24 as well, starting at verse 44. Listen. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Well, here's what jumps out at me there. That, that sentence, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. In other words, what Jesus was doing there is he's reading and talking Bible with them. Right? He's teaching them one final time how the Bible showed that he was the promised one. And so that God's promises always come true. He was teaching them how the Bible showed that his suffering and death was a necessary part of fulfilling God's plan and God's promise. He was showing them how the Bible taught that his, his mission wasn't about reclaiming territory, but it was about healing and restoring broken and wounded hearts. He was teaching him how Bible taught that, that he was truly Lord and God and rescuer and redeemer. And when the disciples, after the ascension, remembered that Bible teaching of Jesus, that last lesson and instruction that he'd given them, what they saw at Jesus' ascension became kind of like the exclamation point on that. The, aha, now I get this moment that the Bible teaching that Jesus had just given them was, was true. That when he told them who he was and, and what his mission was about, that it had all gone according to plan. That they could, in fact, trust that God would keep all his promises that he'd made in the Bible. And so I think that's a part of the reason that even when things didn't turn out the way that they wanted or expected them to, and they were still a, a little confused and uncertain about what had happened and even about what was coming next, 
they were still able to live joyfully. And to me, that suggests this. If you want to live joyfully when things aren't turning out the way you want or expect them to, read some Bible. Read some Bible. Maybe read a lot of Bible. Or at least some consistent Bible, like that verse of the day thing you keep hearing me talk about. Reading Bible is going to help you remember how great God is. Reading Bible is going to help you remember how good God is. Reading Bible is going to help you remember that Jesus loves you. How much he loves you. So much that he, he suffered for you. That he died for you. How he, he came to back from the dead for you. How he literally moved heaven and earth and seemingly did impossible things so that he could be with you forever and you could be with him. Right? Reading Bible is going to help you remember Jesus promises things like, I am with you always. Reading Bible is going to help you remember God's track record and looking at his track record, seeing that you can trust that God's promises will come true even if you're not sure how. Reading Bible is going to help you remember Jesus love you forever, like you for always, holding you in your arms, in his arms, and rocking you back and forth presence even when you're kind of appearing to, to experience his absence. Reading the Bible is going to help you remember all that. And so like the disciples, you can have joy when you remember those things, even if you're not particularly happy about the circumstances you seem to find yourself in. So what, what can you do to live joyfully at times like that? Read some Bible. Here's the other thing that jumps out at me in Luke's recording of this event. I mean, check out what Luke reports about what the disciples did after the ascension. I'm reading from verse 52. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. What did the disciples do there? The disciples worshipped Jesus. They did that right after he left. They worshipped Jesus immediately up there on the mountain. And then they went back to Jerusalem and they continued to worship Jesus at the temple. So they worshipped Jesus. Luke makes a big point. They stayed continually at the temple. So they worshipped Jesus continually, meaning more than just now and then, more than just once, more than just every once in a while. They worship Jesus continually, and they also worship Jesus communally. Communally, like with other people, not, not just themselves. And that sort of worship seemed to fuel their joy. Again, it seemed to fuel their joy even when things hadn't turned out like they wanted or expected. And they were still a little confused, not only about the present, but about the what's next. 
and it seems to me, again, if you want to live joyfully, when you find yourself in those same sorts of situations, you might want to consider doing the same thing. Worship Jesus. Right? Worship continually, meaning frequently, and worship communally, meaning with others. Now, as I read that Luke's report this time, I kind of wondered, well, why did the disciples choose to worship in the temple? I mean, this is only 40 days after the resurrection, and the Jewish leaders who had killed Jesus were still grumpy, and things were not not particularly safe for the disciples yet. They still might have been in danger, and there were safer and more convenient places for them to worship. Uh, and the locked, the room behind locked doors where they were staying kind of comes to mind with that one. So, so why the temple? Right, well, well, the temple is God's house. All right? And while God's house is not the only place for worship or the only place that you can worship, remember, they started worshiping Jesus on the mountain, Perhaps God's house, it just might be the best place that you can worship. Now, let me connect a few dots with that. When God had Solomon build the temple, he said, I will put my name there. Now, when Jesus prayed for his disciples and us, for all believers, he said, protect them by the power of your name. Remember, one of the things he's protecting us from is, is Satan's made in his mission to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the things that Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy is your joy in your spirit. So when Jesus prayed, protect them by the power of your name. And one of the places God promises to place his name is the temple. Doesn't it make sense that if you want to protect your joy that you'd get there to the temple, to the church, to the place where God's placed his name and, and promised to show up? I mean, perhaps that's why the Bible gives us so many directives about worshiping together with others. For example, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. And holy means special, set apart. Um, dedicated to making sure there's time for connecting with God. Or what about this one, Hebrews 10, 25? We should not stop gathering together with other believers, as some of you are doing. And perhaps that's why Luke continued to write about Jesus' followers finding joy in the context of worship, even when things in their life were still challenging or confusing. Here's one of those places, Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God enjoying the, and enjoying the favor of all the people. You know what those commands... Uh, and, and examples do? Well, they protect us from our rationalizations and self-justifications for, for not worshiping God together. And they also point us toward the blessings and the benefits of worshiping Jesus with others. So, so let's drill down on that a little deeper. I mean, how does worship help you live joyfully even when you're dealing with, with stuff that you don't like or don't understand. Well, there's a word part to worship. So the worship helps you hear God's voice and perspective, not just your own. Worship also helps you look upward, not just inward. Worship also reminds you of God's greatness and God's grace. And worship reminds you of God's presence and God's promises. And get this, worship also is a place where you receive God's gifts, which, well, you need all the time, but, but maybe especially 
when in those times when things aren't going according to plan or expected and, and sadness and confusion are, are trying to take over your heart, I think you really need God's gifts then. And, and when you gather to worship together with others, well, you get gifts from God, you, you get his word, you get communion, you get this, this sense of his presence, and you also get the blessing of other people. Right, the blessing of other people. Now, now, part of that blessing is what I'll call the energy of the crowd. Unless this is your, your very first time listening to me, you know that I love sports. Love playing sports, love watching sports. So, so to me, watching sports alone is, well, it's great. But watching sports with a few other people, a few other fans of the same team, well, that, that's even better. And going to the game in person and being surrounded by the crowd, that, that's even better. And, gee, I remember a couple of times that I was privileged to be able to go to a, a playoff game. And that was absolutely incredible. So, so what you happen is, is each place where there's more people, there, there's more energy. And that energy has a way of, of energizing you of lifting your spirit, of rebooting your joy. And, and that's the sort of thing that happens when you worship together with others. I mean, and that's why it's such an important part of living joyfully. And here's something else that worshiping together with others does. All right, when sometimes when, when life is challenging or confusing, it's like you just want to be alone. I mean, that, that's what it feels like. You just want to be away from others. You don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to share. You don't want to be connected in any way. And maybe that feels best to you when you're confused and miserable and, and nothing's working out the way you want it to. But is it best? Is it best? Is isolation and loneliness are some of Satan's favorite playgrounds. And places that if we're playing around in those places for, for too long, he's going to use to drive us to discouragement and disillusionment and despair. He's going to use it to, to steal and kill and destroy your joy and your spirit. And God has a better idea. God has a better idea. And worshiping Jesus together with other people, well, that's how you find joy, not only in the presence of God, you also find it in the people of God. The people of God who you can lean into when life is hard. People who will listen to you. People who will empathize with you. People who will laugh and cry with you. People who will pray with you and who are silently praying for you. I think that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote in Galatians uh, chapter 6, help carry each other's burdens. In this way you will fulfill Christ's teachings. See, worshiping Jesus with others is part of God's plan for living joyfully. And then there's music and singing.
Music and singing is also a part of worshiping together. And music and singing is another thing that, that helps you find joy even, even if you're not feeling particularly happy. I mean, unless it's a funeral dirge in some really dark minor key, it's hard not to get a joy boost when, when you're singing, especially if the music's a little upbeat. I mean, that's just how God wired us. And that's what God created music and singing to do and to be. And I think that's why God, from the beginning, had music and singing be part of the, the worship of the community. I, I mean, doubt me, read the Psalms. It was the songbook of, of back in the day. And there's so many of the Psalms that talk about music and singing. And then there's something else about music and singing. I've mentioned a few times this year how my sister, the music therapist, has been talking to me about the science of behind singing, how music speaks truth right to our emotions. And I think that's another reason that, that music and singing can bring you joy even if you're not necessarily happy. And then there's this. D did you know that when we're worshiping together, that we're not just singing with other people in the room, that we're also singing along with heaven, <laughs> and that heaven's singing along with us. I mean, talk about a perspective that gives us a, a joy boost and helps you live joyfully even when things aren't working out like you expected and you're not particularly happy. I love how one of the old liturgies puts it, that therefore with angels, and with archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing holy, holy, holy. I mean, read, read Revelation 4 and 5 sometime. I mean, some people suggest that Revelation 4 and 5 is a picture of Jesus' ascension, but from the perspective of heaven, watching the conquering hero return home. And... And here's how that section wraps up. Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse 11. Then I heard the voices of many angels, the four living creatures, and the leaders surrounding the throne. They numbered 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands times thousands. In a loud voice, they were singing, The Lamb who was slain deserves to receive power and wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and on the sea. Every creature in those places was singing. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. Then the leaders bowed and worshiped. That's our backup chorus when we're worshiping together. Every creature in heaven and on earth singing God's praises together. Thousands and thousands, millions and millions, all singing with one voice in praise and honor and glory to God. I mean, that's what's happening when we're worshiping together. C can you see that? The energy? Can, can you feel the energy? Do, do you need that energy, that, that, that joy boost? Want to live more joyfully, even when you're living in a little confused or uncertain, even when things are a little sad, even when things aren't turning out the way you want or expect them to? Well, follow the disciples' lead. Read some more Bible and worship Jesus together with others.